right. So we have Christian Huey. So he is a partner at Clear Sky Liquor Consultants. Christian has over 20 years experience working with the Canada Revenue Agency specializing in excise duty. Christian is widely respected in the liquor and cannabis industries for his technical knowledge and his deep understanding of the complexities of federal and provincial regulations. The knowledge gained over the last 20 years has allowed him to develop a network of long-standing relationships um, with government agencies and regulatory officials at all levels. So that's Christian, and then we have Nancy Lamb. Nancy Lamb uh, works in regulatory compliance with the BC Liquor Distribution Branch. Uh, Nancy has worked her way up the ranks from senior auditor when she joined the BC Liquor Distribution Branch in 2008 uh, to uh, senior manager in corporate audit in 2016 before becoming the, the finance director of regulatory and compliance in 2021. That's a mouthful there. <laughs> So uh, she is committed to continually improving government relations with BC wineries, distilleries, and breweries in the business area of regulatory compliance. Awesome. Oh, thank you for that, Nick. Um, so we're just going to get started here. I know Don's already provided a bit of an overview of what today's session is going to be. Um, and we are going to be focused on some components of the sales agreement, as well as some key areas regarding the LTB audit for your information today. So I'll just skip to this. So first off, um, like Don mentioned, we did have the MNP review um, a, a couple years ago, and my team and I have been in the process of trying to implement the recommendations and some of the gaps that have been ident identified. So I'm going to share with you some of those highlights today. So first up is the educational information. So my team and I have developed a number of resources that would be available to you on the BC LDP website. Um, it includes things like an audit process flow diagram to provide you an overview of what the audit process looks like. There's an audit explainer video um, that you can go through and it talks to you and walks you through some of the audit processes so that you are going into this fully informed. Uh, we have also developed a record keeping guideline for the each type of manufacturer. So for you guys, you guys would be most interested in the brewery ones. So those have been tailored um, to meet what the, you guys do in the breweries. So we have uh, individual ones for uh, a separate one for wineries and a separate one for distilleries. And we've also included other items like um, there's an audit questionnaire in there uh, to give you a little bit of insights into what the auditor is asking. Within that questionnaire, we have um, a question regarding your period end because one of the feedback we heard from um, some of the manu uh, from breweries and manufacturers that were a part of that audit is that sometimes those dates don't al always align with what you guys are, are doing in the breweries. So there's a question within the questionnaire that asks you what those dates are. And then the team would uh, um, try their best in order to try to to meet those so that when you're reconciling records and, and, and numbers and figures that they do align with your peer end in order to make it a little bit easier um, on your side. Um, we also have um, an on-site visit guideline. So this is when the auditor attends your brewery um, and what you can expect to happen that day. So it walks you through what that process looks like so that you aren't surprised on the day of the visit and that you have time to prepare for the things that are to come once they actually join you on your site. Um, so now a couple um, things, points on the process changes. So like Don mentioned earlier, uh, a key piece of that is communication. So we are um, changing our some of our processes in order to improve your engagement throughout the audit process. So one of those key items are going to be a monthly dashboard that provides you information on where the audit is at, any information that might be missing on your side, any follow-up items that the LDB is working on, and then have that dialogue on a regular basis so that it provides you time to ask questions. If there are things that the auditors have found up until that point, those would be conveyed to you at this point as well. So again, that you aren't surprised once the audit is finished of any of the findings that um, the auditors have come across during the audit process. So we're hoping this process will, one, provide you with the information you need, uh, provide you with the updates you need around where your audit is at, and also be able to give you an opportunity to ask any questions about the process as we move forward with the audit and not waiting until the end when the audit is done and you get a letter which ends up blindsiding you in terms of what that letter contains. Um, another key piece item that we are going to be um, rolling out is a new uh, regulatory audit review. So I can move this here. So um, the new regulatory review uh, includes really trying to engage our new manufacturers 
uh, early on uh, in the establishment of their business. So we will have a new uh, manufacturer onboarding process, which I'll talk a little bit more in the next slide. Um, what, that also includes a new regulatory review. What this means is that the team will be um, visiting your site within one or two years of, um, of business opening. And the key, the key focus for this is really to visit and find, um, check in to, with you to see how things are going, um, review sort of the, some of your record keeping uh, practices. And if there are any gaps or any areas for improvement, the team will be able to provide you with that recommendation early on so that you can make those changes early on in your operations versus waiting for um, an audit to actually occur. So the team will be reaching out to you in order to do that. We're hoping that this initial piece will provide you with some additional information, maybe correct or implement new processes that would make you more likely to be compliant with the rules and regulations. And again, also provide you with an opportunity to ask questions should they come up since now you've been in operations, maybe you've encountered some things, maybe you have questions, you don't know how to reach, who to reach out to. This provides another touch point for, um, between us and the, um, the brewery. Okay, so for new manufacturers, for those of you who are new, you'll recognize this process. So the first is you submit an application. You get an approval in principle from both L um, LCRB as well as LDB. Um, LCRB will do their final inspection um, and then we'll provide final approvals. And that's where it stops. Then you go off, you go do your business, you run uh, and produce beer. What we're doing is we're gonna be implementing this last step, which is the new onboarding um, process for manufacturers. What this includes is an additional touch point early on again, to really make sure that you have the information you need to be successful um, and that um, you have, you're all set up in order to run your business. What does this include? It includes things like making sure you have the access you need in order to um, report your sales, make sure you have the contact information and, and the sign-in information for the, the, the vendor website, how to register your products. Um, the team will also walk you through the website. So the website, um, we've uploaded a number of resource materials for you, which I mentioned earlier. Those are available to you. Um, and so they'll walk you through the website, the resources that are available. Um, encourage you, of course, to review the explainer video as well as the audit flowchart, just so that you get that understanding of what LDB audit would look like. Um, and then um, giving you, again, an opportunity to ask questions, because I think this is, it's really important so that you have some face-to-face -face time with LDB and as well as to be able to have some dedicated time to ask any questions that might come up in reviewing some of the documentations, maybe something's not clear to you, or maybe something's come up, or maybe one of your staff asked you a question that you, like maybe you had a book, bookkeeper and they don't know how to do certain parts of it. The team can help you navigate through who to reach out to. If it's requiring some additional clarification, the team can provide that guidance as well. So this is gonna be a key piece for those new manufacturers, really trying to establish that educational piece very, very early on in your business. Oh, thanks. Okay, so down to the nitty gritty, record keeping and the audit, fun stuff. Um, so, so some key things for you. Um, records have to be being maintained for six years. So it, you have to keep these, this at your um, site and it can be reviewed. And it's not just LDB as well as uh, CRA audits as well. Um, and so our general, guidelines is that we would audit the two most recent years. Um, and then if there are significant anomalies or variances identified, we would go further back, but we would start with the first two um, and then, and then, you know, move on from there. And then this is, this is one of the reasons why uh, record keeping is so important is because we don't want to go back either. We don't want to have to audit more years than we have to. And so we'd like to keep it to the two. And then uh, if your records are good, they're clean, they support all of the reporting that you've done, um, and variances aren't identified, over sweet, short and sweet. Um, I am going to, at this point, turn it over to Christian. He's just going to provide you a little bit more information from his work that he, he does with you guys. Thanks, Nancy. Um, so yeah, I, I guess like, I want to reiterate, like the one plus one rule is also in alignment to the CRA practices. So generally, when you're audited for CRA, they'll come in and do a, a one plus one, meaning that there's a, the, the focus is generally within the first year and then they'll expand back in the second year. Um, but re one thing to note is in regards to federal statute is there's lists, statute of limitations, which is four years. So in the event that record keeping is poor, they have the right to go back 
four years of what's been assessed for returns. Um, and even further in, in regards to if there's any type of gross negligence, they actually can go back as far as that six year record retention requirement. So that's where Nancy and I both stress, it's very important to have the proper record keeping and control because in the event that you don't, uh, there are audit techniques that they can undertake that can get them to what they want in terms of um, finding out or quantifying values. And usually these, they're called indirect tests. They don't work out within the favor of a manufacturer because what they're doing is they're, they're looking at taking the information, say, from purchases of raw material and projecting what you could have produced in beer or looking at your, your sales information and, and doing indirect tax there to try and confirm back to production. So what you're doing is you're basically opening yourself up for this inherent audit risk because of the fact that you have poor control over your record keeping. Um, so, yeah, that's it. Okay, thanks, Christian. Um, so we're going to delve into a little bit more around the package product movement summary. So this is a key requirement that's contained within your sales agreement. Um, I'm not going to go over the entire spreadsheet because those who you recognize it, it's this long spreadsheet that kind of goes this way. Um, Christian and I, through collaboration, have identified uh, a few key sections of the package product movement summary that we wanted to highlight for you today. And that being just historical information that I've received through the audit. And of course, Christian's work that he's done with a number of the breweries as well to, to identify some key areas that require some additional clarification. Okay. So first, we're going to talk about sales in return. Sounds pretty simple. You make product, you sell product, customer return products. Where this becomes a little bit more confusing is within your facility when you move product from your back of house or your warehouse into um, the front of house or like your tasting rooms or your, um, you know. so that's part, sometimes that gets confusing because to you, it's still within your brewery. But that transaction actually happens, has to be reported to the LDB as a sale. Um, similar to um, returns from customer. Again, sounds pretty simple. Customers return products to you. Where it can get a little bit confusing is that oftentimes, from what we've heard from the breweries, is those returns result in destruction because either it was off tasting or it's part of uh, a batch that you know you're going to you're recalling back. So that product comes back from the customer, and what some breweries don't recognize is that product actually gets added back into your inventory. So it gets ba added back to your facility. It requires an additional step if you're going to destroy the product, if it was off tasting, for example, um, and you need to maintain records for both parts of that transaction. So the returns as well as the destruction. So sometimes what we've encountered is that breweries said that these returns come in and it was destroyed, but they didn't keep the destruction records in order to substantiate that those products were destroyed. And we have no way of knowing that it was destroyed. So I know sometimes it's just inherently for you guys from a business perspective that it gets returned, it gets destroyed. It's very simple, very straight, but for, for, for from our perspective, it's two separate transactions and it requires two separate sets of um, supporting documentation. So just keep that in mind when you are getting things back from the, the customers, that you do maintain that destruction record as well, so that uh, at the time of the audit, those can be presented um, to substantiate the destruction figures that you're reporting on the package movement summary. Yes, of course. So when, uh, when to keep the records of the destruction, there's, there's very specific ways you have, that you, there's only a few specific ways you can keep those records. So you can, can you get everybody hear me? So, oh, for the recording. Um, there's very specific ways that you can record that those destructions. So, uh, for example, what we do is we have a pallet in the brewery that if customer returns come back, we file our returns, and then they, they the beer goes onto a pallet and just sits there. And as it builds up over time, once it's large enough, we'll go. There's several bonded warehouses that will destroy full product. Uh, you send it there. You give them a list of the SKUs, the number of of cans or flats that you sent, and they'll give you a record of destruction, that uh, the certificate of destruction that the LDB will accept as proof of being destroyed. 
another one is dumping kegs. We have a uh, Google Doc drive that anytime an old keg or a stale dated keg is returned and dumped, that we do a five second video of the of the keg collar and then the video of the dump and that gets uploaded onto our Google Drive. And then at the end of the year, or when we do our product movement summary or whatever, we declare it all as what all that volume as destroyed. And then during an audit, we can just send a Google link and they can they can just see all that proof of all of that beer being dumped. So you got to be really specific and really, uh, I use Blue Planet. There's a couple of other places that will do, do destroy your beer, but that is, it's not cheap, but it's a lot cheaper than paying retail markup on the product that's not tracked. Yes. It, as, as soon as you file the Doc 55, that product goes back into your product available, available for sale, sale av available for sale. And then it, so you need to get rid of it. Yes. Well, sorry, one, two. One thing also to note is you know, there's multiple levels of government here, right? So um, there's a provincial regulations, there's a federal regulation. So for any destruction that you're going to be claiming duty um, credits back, you need authorization from them prior to destroying. So maintain any type of documentation with that as well, because that will also help support your destructions. Um, and to answer the question uh, the gentleman had, had here regarding, uh, could you just absorb it? That's a choice um, that that you have because that's kind of similar to not maintaining the records. Uh, but just know that maybe we're looking at the full year and those destructions can add up, even though that one situation seems small. So just something to keep in mind as you run through your operations on whether you can absorb that one instance, what happens if there's more and what do you do with those going forward um, and really be able to weigh that out um, from, a, from a cost perspective for you. Yes. Um, no. So like Don mentioned, you could do things like videos or photos. You could use a third party um, and or if you send things out to, to be destroyed to a company, that's probably the easiest because it is a third party verification. But photos and, and videos work as well. Um, so those are the, probably the easiest ones at, at hand since, you know, most individuals have cell phones um, and recording the destruction process is probably going to be the least cost um, to the brewery. Also, you want to note that um, when you're asking for approval from the excise for destruction, they may come and attend and witness the destruction itself. So, um, yeah, it's one of those things where you, you basically want to make sure you've got all your, your bases covered. Um, and on that note, too, if you are getting approval from CRA, you don't have to do separate documentation for the LTB. Um, if the CRA attends the destructions and they approve it and you have the approval from them for that, um, the LTB would accept that as well. So it's, it's we're not trying to duplicate efforts here either. Um, did you have a question? Yeah. Yes. I think you're going to need a little bit more than that, that the actual product was destroyed. Because I think what we're looking for here is that the product was actually destroyed, um, uh, not just the the bookkeeping of saying that it was destroyed. Was destroyed. So I just had one more question here. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. So it depends if you're planning to claim back the excess taxes, like Christian mentioned. If you are planning to do that, yes, wait, because like Christian mentioned earlier, CRA may decide to attend this destruction and witness the destruction. Um, and so you don't want to already have destroyed it <laughs> before they could come and witness it, because I, I, don't, I don't think that'll be too well on the... Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, CRA, we've already destroyed it. <laughs> yeah. So we've tried to keep the presentation um, quite... Uh, condensed and very short overall with uh, the plans for a number of questions at the end. We've left roughly about 15 minutes or so at the end. So the presentation is only a few slides in total. We, you know, trying to keep it short and sweet so that you guys can have some time for some questions. So I'm just going to try to get through the next few slides and then we can uh, shoot over to uh, questions. Okay, so the next section we're going to talk about here is production. 
So this is a key part of your brewery uh, operations is making the product. So one of the key things that we've um, noticed uh, from a clarifying perspective is that excise allows you to round down. So when you fill out the excise monthly reports, you're able to round down um, on your production. And so sometimes what we get uh, as part of the package movement summary uh, reporting is that you're also using those round down numbers for LDB. So for LDB, you're actually reporting your actual production. So um, when you're filling out the package product movement summary, use your actual production numbers and not what you reported to CRA. Because uh, oftentimes that's where we see some of those variances um, is because you're using the CRA numbers. I, I completely understand the confusion here, hence the reason why we wanted to raise this here so that um, we're able to provide that additional information and uh, to know that LDB is actually looking for full production numbers. And so just to elaborate a little bit more on what uh, Christian mentioned earlier around production records and any other type of records is that from an LDB perspective, we want to be able to audit you and look at the records as they are. So from the what Christian mentioned, direct method. So we look at your production and we look at your sales or returns and review your invoices, your shipping, your bill of ladings, those types of things, simple. If we get to encounter a situation where those records aren't complete, then it starts getting a little bit more complicated. And LDB, we don't want to do that either. But if there are the records aren't available, we would have to move to that. So this is why we really, really want to reinforce the importance of record keeping. And that's why the team has gone through that exercise of developing those record keeping guidelines for you as a reference and help guide you through what records would be required for each of those items. I think one thing to also note is that <clears throat> there, there are going to be general guidelines. Um, no government authority is going to say this is specifically how you have to maintain your records because they don't want to box themselves into the enforcement of it. Um, so you just want to make sure that like you continually review what you're, you're producing in terms of record keeping and that it's compliant in the sense of what each program is wanting to uh, to enforce or object like the, the LDB enforces the sales agreement they're reviewing for markup the CRA enforces the excise act and they're they're paying they're looking at production for duty so they're you know they're similar in, in nature but each program has its own objective to to basically enforce so you just want to be aware of that not saying you have to maintain two sets of records, uh, but hopefully the one uh, will satisfy both organizations. Like I said, we don't want to duplicate work. We do want to make this as simple as possible where you're not having a, this is the records I need to keep for LDB. These are the records I need to keep for um, CRA. And these are the records I need to keep for LCRB, right? So we're trying to keep it simple. So your set of records should be able to um, accommodate all of those um, without actually having to create different sets of documents to support that. So next we're going to move over to these two sections, transfers in and out of province, as well as exports. So on the package product movement summary reporting that we get annually from you guys, uh, we've been noticing some mix up between these two categories. Um, so sometimes the, um, the transfer is actually being reported out of province or Canada, and they're not in the right bucket. So what this means is that the transfers to and from province is within the Canadian, like within Canada, but two different provinces. So Alberta, um, Ontario, you know, those type things. Exports is purely products that you're shipping out of Canada. So if there are products that you're shipping out of Canada, they fall into this bucket. Um, and then if it's to other provinces, it's this bucket. But when we're looking at the package product movement summary, we've been seeing either everything being reported under exports or everything being reported under transfers or mixing them up entirely. So I wanted to call that out today just uh, from a you know information um, perspective. So on the next slide, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the documents. So record keeping, because we're focused on record keeping today. Um, what kind of uh, documents do you need to keep? This goes with sales, this goes with returns, it goes with destruction. So key pieces of information here is who is the product going to, where is it going to, what products are, are being shipped, and how much is being shipped. So all of that information would be um, it, important for you to keep on that document. Um, and like I said, it doesn't have to be multiple documents. If you have a bill of lading that includes the customer's name, the location, and all of the products that's on that shipment, great. Uh, if you have an invoice to that same customer that shows the same quantity, awesome. 
Um, so we're not trying to create additional documentation here. It's just really trying to emphasize the documents that you currently maintain and the information that's needed. And if it's missing information um, in order to, to add those fields into those um, the existing documents without generating new ones, because we're not trying to make work um, for this. So yeah, what Nancy basically discusses, is it's not one specific document that would support that, that export or transaction. Um, there's, you know, multiple different things that you can provide to, to give the auditor assurance that, you know, the product's been exported or transferred to another province. Um, one example I, I know of is some breweries will export to South Korea and within their documentation, they actually have to obtain from the, the municipality a certificate of origin. So having, you know, that in a, with a commercial invoice, with a bill of lading, with, you know, um, <clears throat> I guess, you know, pretty much everything that supports that transaction, that gives them that degree of proof that that, that has occurred. And also payment, like with CRA, they usually always try and follow through the payment. So if you even have verification that this invoice has been paid, then they now have full assurance this transaction has occurred. Thanks for that, Christian. So I did promise you 15 minutes for Q&A. So last slide, because um, we're just at that point now. So the last uh, piece here I wanted to talk to you about today is around inventory and inventory accounts. So on the package product movement summary, there are two columns for inventory. One is what you called calculated inventory. And then second is physical inventory. Just gonna go through a little bit around the difference between the two. So calculated inventory is um, made up of a formula. So it takes things into account what you started with, what you made, what you sold, what you shipped out of country, and what we calculate to be what your ending inventory should be. So this is what you should have in your warehouse at the end of March 31st. Then that gets compared to the physical count that you do on March 31st. So this is what's actually in your warehouse. The difference between those two does create a variance, um, and that variance would be subject to markup. So this is why it's important. I, I, we know we have the requirements for you to do the inventory count at March 31, but it's also important for you to maintain that inventory reliability throughout that year. Because uh, some things that might happen are, well, let's call it out, theft within the warehouse um, is one of those things. And if you don't identify those uh, types of gaps or, or, or lack of controls early on, by the time you get to the year end, there's this large variance that you can't explain. You have no idea what happened to it. So if you're able to, to um, maintain proper inventory records and inventory management throughout the year, if you're starting to notice variances happening, you can try to nip that in the bud early on, add in some additional controls at the warehouse, or you know do some investigative pieces from your office operation side, waiting till year end where 12 months of operations has already occurred. And those things add up very, very quickly. Um, and so that's why it's really important to maintain that inventory, even outside of the, the, the requirements that LDD has for inventory. You want to add yeah. So it, when it comes to requirement for maintaining or conducting a uh, fiscal count on inventory, this excise program has one as well that most people aren't aware of. Uh, Section 31 deems that you have to uh, do a package goods count at your year end. So most people being on a calendar year, December 31st, they actually have a requirement to have physical count of packaged goods. So that's just another you know, step or control for a benchmark for you guys to do any type of reconciliation. If you're ensuring that you have an accurate count um, and then you do your March 31st count, you can then work backwards to see whether that product was missing at March 31st or, or not. Um, so it's one of those things where you, know, you do have requirement to conduct these um, and they're unfortunately for each program there's different you know marks but it's building kind of a a, a cyclical um uh, reconciliation count for you guys because every three three months from your year end to the march 31st you'll have two separate inventory counts that you can conduct and, and do review on so um having a more frequency within these cyclical counts creates a better control so that you can identify these variances and investigate or find them sooner right Thank you, Christian. So now we are in the questions phase. And as promised, it's 1216, so slightly over. Um, I'm just going to go to this gentleman here because I saw his hand go up first. Sure. Uh, so to the last comment, is it an advantage to have your year end to match up with the LED year end? Or I mean, it would, it would make you have only one uh, account, right? Like, so it, it all depends on obviously your fiscal, how you want to set that fiscal. But a lot of people are on a calendar year, so that in itself ends up having two fiscal counts that you're required to do. Um, 
but they strongly encourage like because there's so many moving parts of a brewery. I'm sorry. Um, they strongly encourage because there's so many moving parts in the brewery that you have these controls in place because um, one of the issues is like you have sales staff coming and grabbing product. Um, best practice or best, you know, um, standard operating procedure is actually have that product sold to your front of house and then they can only take from that product, not from the production facility. Um, cause what happens over time is these variances, they grow large because, you know, you got a guy grabbing a 50 liter K or whatever here and there. Um, and if you have that breakdown over that, that, that package goods inventory, that's where you're having these issues with variants, right? Just on that inventory count too, if your year end is December 31st, like Christian mentioned earlier, you'd be doing a count for the CRA, but then you'd be doing another one for March. And if there are large variants within that time frame, at least you've isolated where some of those variances might happen. If they're small, then at least, you know, that period is fine. And then you can focus your efforts on looking for variances in those other parts of that calendar year. I see. Yes. Bulk. Bulk. Mm -hmm. But LPG separates that fully in packaging. Packaged. Like, I need like 50 liters of uh, sanitizer burns that you're not going to use on the house. Like a markup on that. Well, for so for yeah, so so availability of product is what they're looking at. Excise as well, right? So stamp pipe loss, if you're basically tapping a tank and paying duties on that, stamp pipe loss comes off the availability. So say you had a 10 hectare tank, there's a 50 liter stamp pipe, it's now 9.5 hectoliters. When you tap that, you round down to nine, and it's a nine hectoliter tapping. Yeah. yeah. Available. Bottled. Available for sale. Yeah. Packaged so and bottled. Not include the stamp pipe loss yeah. because it's not available. Okay. Yeah. 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 And it didn't go into uh, packaging. <laughs> yeah. As long as it's not being consumed, it, that's kind of the intent. Okay. Like, that's the big thing. You yeah. Want to see. If it's being consumed, just mark up and excise that deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then my other one is sure. the uh, solar effect. Um, so the same thing, obviously, you can mm -hmm. and the amount of stuff happening. Um, but this takes a little bit more time to play with. Is it valuable just to absorb that time as well? How do you take care of that? As you go out, you don't get that split. Because I'm mm -hmm. So the response is the same as I talked about earlier around destruction. So this is a, a cost to your business. So you have to kind of weigh that out. And if to your point, if it's small and you want to absorb it, that that's something that you can decide on. But just know that's like I said earlier, this the situation itself, that small amount might be small for that instance. But of course, we're looking at an annual product movement. So it can add up very, very quickly. And so if you have a good handle and you know what your cumulative amounts are, and then you want to implement sort of investigations and things after you reach a certain threshold, that's completely the call of the brewery. Um, but just know sometimes what I've seen is that threshold is um think is not a lot and then it ends up being more and then you didn't start the investigation part early and then you end up absorbing more than you had intended so just really keeping an eye on that um and, and of course you know cost benefit comes into play here too right yes. oh. sorry i just wanted to expand there is a 0.5 percent shrinkage allowance, a 0.05 percent shrinkage allowance for package for the the provincial purposes so you have a little bit of a shrinkage i personally think it should be a little higher but that's another matter. Uh, that's another forum to discuss. But so you do have a little bit of a tolerance because, you know, the, there is like, it's a lot of moving, it's a physical commodity, there's moving parts, things can go missing. It may not be intentionally theft. Um, but yeah, like you, you do want to control your package goods because you're subject to that markup, right? And you've already paid the excise duty on it because it's been packaged. So. Yes. Sorry, go ahead. Mm -hmm. 
um, maybe I could add to that just by having the, maybe not a video at the end, but perhaps just a snapshot of the, 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 the empties and of the things of all the things that you've destroyed to show the volume. So that we're seeing it from start, middle and finish, uh, right? Because otherwise it just leaves a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, so other, just close that loop off. One of the other practices I've seen that they support like that is also um, like your employment record, like if you have a work ticket order system that you've allocated that task to people, and you're obviously paying them hourly to do that task. So there's a lot of ways to support it, like in addition to pictures and everything, like you're like, hey, look, my payroll, I, I brought in this person specifically for destruction. They were there for eight hours doing this and I paid them for eight hours. And here is the picture and video proof as well. It's a little bit like a puzzle, <laughs> like a number of pieces put together to give us the full picture of what's actually happened. So in this case, the full destruction. I think there's a question at the end. Yes. <laughs> sure. Um, and we don't cherry pick breweries. <laughs> Let's see. Yes. So uh, how we write the breweries, there's a lot of breweries and lots of manufacturers within BC, and we provide oversight and audits uh, for all of them. So we do use a risk-based approach in order to determine which uh, breweries will get audited. Um, and I will call it right out to you. If you've been audited and there were variances from your audit, you can probably bet on us coming back. Uh, but for the ones who haven't been audited, it is, um, you know, all the breweries get put into a bucket. We go through a variety of different factors to determine uh, who we're going to visit this year. Uh, we do have limited resources, so we do have to use those resources as best we can and get the results that we can. Um, so that does mean, yes, we won't be able to reach out all, to all 800 manufacturers that are in BC currently, um, but we do have a process to do that. Um, and it is random so it isn't oh I think I want to go here or I think I want to go here um, there is a process and there's a number of factors that are considered in that process I could speak on my experience with CRA uh, they're a little bit different they have a program where they basically want to have coverage within four to six years so there's generally going to be an excise audit either regular audit or regulatory review within that six-year period so an the difference between an audit and a regulatory review, audit is a full scope usually, it entails full review of production um, from raw material to packaging. Uh, the regulatory review is more of a snapshot review of one particular part of your, your operation. So they may come out and say, hey, we wanna look at your destructions or we wanna look at your credits or we wanna look at your raw material inventory. So um, that in itself, you'll just expect to be a, have the visit. Again, CRA does have risk assessment, obviously, through the system. If there's flags for them, they'll feel like they need to come out and visit you. Um, but again, it's a program where, because of that history of prohibition, they're going to ensure that they're being out there, right? They're going to be within the industry. And that's, a, that's in line with our regulatory review that we'll be um, implementing as well, what I mentioned earlier. Um, we are focused on uh, the record keeping and being able to zoom in into that process uh, so that we can provide the recommendations to the brewery for any improvements uh, for you to take into consideration and implement in the early years of operations. And there was a question on this side. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so... Um, so, uh, so I will address, not address, but I will speak to the um, CRA part. So um, like one of the questions uh, what, that was asked earlier, the difference um, on the production side of things. So CRA is at the bulk level. So any of the, the allowance that they provide are at the bulk level. LDB is on the package side. So that 0.5% that you're, you, you, you see for the brewery um, are at the production um, package side. So any losses that you've claimed through CRA on the bulk, isn't included in that. So this is after things are pro uh, are, are bottled and or canned. Um, and then that, that shrinkage allowance comes into play. Um, and yes, it is different for each of the different manufacturers. So breweries have a have one, the wineries have one, and the distillery have a different one. I'm sure they're available on the website, right? <laughs> Well, yeah, and one thing to note, like the way with excise it works is at time of packaging, that's when the duties are paid on. There's no deferral. There's nothing. So you're paying on it as once packaged. That the bulk portion is like you're subject to that 5% allowance for packaging within the month. 
So that's like kind of one of their requirements that a lot of people aren't aware of that you have to stay within that 5% of available that, that was actually packaged. So it's not actually 5%, it's a little bit less than 5%. Yes. Um, so we would look at um, the productions for the months that we do have. Um, compare it year over year is one mechanism. We look at um, your inputs. So like Christian mentioned earlier, any of your raw materials that you've purchased, what that would usually yield based on the production records that you already have. So what is the general loss for each of these runs? Um, we'd work through that formula to anticipate or to estimate what your production would have been for that um, the ingredient for the purchase of those ingredients. So, I mean, those aren't ideal. And I think it's not a one-to-one -one either. So in the case where we're able to validate production with your brew sheets and your things like that, that's simple, straight. I do one test, I can validate that. In this indirect one, I'd likely have to do multiple tests. And so it does add time to the audit. It also adds um, a a additional tests, right? So I have to do a number of them in order to replace this direct method. Um, and there's obviously because we're using, you know, raw ingredients and estimates on what that production is. Um, like Christian mentioned earlier, it's 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 obviously not what you actually produced, but there's no other mechanisms to get there. So it could be one of those inputs as well. In addition to others, like I said, it's going to be like three tests in exchange for one direct test. So yeah, like Basically, they're looking at, okay, well, what can we use in, in terms of information or documentation to confirm production? So with the malt reconciliation, they would look, oh, is there any variance? Within this variance, can they have made brews? And, you know, the, the floor, if, and this is the, the thing is you need to advocate your operations to the auditor. So if you are aware that there are like losses along the way, say you have a hopper loss and it's, you know, 25 kilos every time that, you know, that's, mm -hmm kind of sitting in queue and everything you need to explain that to them so that when they're doing these recs they can take that into account because the larger that variance in their minds they're going to be like well there's missing malt and for a brewery malt means beer right so what you're talking about with utilities um there's an interesting thing like with cra they will look at like say we are a distillery and say you have an electric still they will look at the hydro to see when you're running your still right because you need to power it to, to boost it. So based on how things are done nowadays, you can actually have a graph within the day to see your power usage. So they you know, will ask if you don't have proper records, they're gonna ask for these other things to kind of support your operations, right? So it's, it's, that's why it's a very important, make sure you have proper record so that they don't have this need to look at other things. We don't wanna look at that either. <laughs> So, you know, record keeping is going to be key here. Uh, yes. For control or, yeah. or standard accounting procedure. Yeah. Or gaps. Yeah. yeah. Increase that inherent risk. And then, they, then instead of vouching verification, now it's indirect testing. Yeah. Right? I'm just curious about the other PLD. So I've always been under the impression that you get one of these bills. Are there some free ones that you should Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, there are. Um, and not every single one of our audits results in an assessment. Sometimes they have some minor non-compliance items that were identified, and they just come out in the form of a letter that says, hey, we noticed these things. These are the things we would recommend for improvement, but it doesn't end up with an, an assessment. So yes, we do have those too. Yeah, that's one, one thing to note is it's not, in this industry, it's not just monetary. There's compliance and regulatory to it. So Part of the, the provincial visits and the CRA visits to ensure not just the revenue aspect, but to ensure that regulatory compliance aspect, and that's to make it a level playing field for the industry to make sure that everybody plays by the same rules. Right? Uh, I think. Oh, sorry. I just want to make that's a fine. quick comment. Yeah. Um, I went through this process for 2019 till 2020, so it was um, in. I, I just wanted to let everybody know that they are literally on your side much like a cra audit well every cra audit i've had has been a lot of hand holding a lot of help really positive experience 
um, the letter and wording and stuff that comes from the, uh, the LDB is harder and harsher and scarier than the actual process. My auditor was fantastic. And my, uh, you know, Michael Bala, who is, who was the, the guy that I was dealing with was super flexible. I worked for nine months on my assessment, just going back and forth and trying to get it to where it w I thought it was right. And so, uh, to Nancy's team, everybody there was fantastic to deal with. So don't be afraid when you get the, the audit notice and just deal with them. They're very helpful. And they, it was a positive experience. <laughs> Thanks, Don. Um, and just to kind of close off, because I know we're at time and I don't, um, we are sitting, we are between you and lunch. Um, so just to close off, off just in, to address the um, Don's comment regarding the the tone and the communication, we've done a significant amount of um, work on trying to revise those ones as well. Uh, with the, the help of Erin and her team, where we've um, updated our templates in order to, to change the tone of those letters as best we can. There's still a legal component to it because it is contractual, but we've modified some of that as well. So it isn't coming off as, as harsh that the, what we might have seen in the past. Um, we've done a number of those types of um, endeavors in order to, to try to improve the communication between us and, and the breweries as well. Um, and then the, the last comment I'll make here is don't be afraid to reach out. So on the website, you'll have a general contact information on there for my team who will do the initial triaging of questions. So if you have questions, don't be afraid to reach out to the team. If you um, wanting to ask about something about the future or something about existing, the team can help navigate that for you. So definitely, if you do have questions, please reach out to the team. If they don't have the answers, they'll escalate it to Mike Ballo, who's my senior manager, um, or over to me and we'll get those um, answers for you. Um, so that's what I can't emphasize that enough that, you know, the team is there in order to help uh, you guys navigate through that. So reach out if you have any questions and the contacts are available on the website, along with the resource that we've posted and yeah i just i strongly suggest that you go through the guidelines first prior to contacting them that way you know you can kind of go through and see and then you may have even more questions after doing that and then they can